developing therapeutic relationships with men is reported to be an important factor in decreasing the rates of dropouts from counseling and upstream programs that aim to help men build better relationships. So what strategies do you take as a as um, a counselor to develop relationship therapeutic relationships with men? Shall I go first? Sure. So again, uh, just re uh, returning to the group of people that I work, men with that I work with, with borderline personality disorder, a couple of things I think would be important to remember, and this was from a review we did recently, is that uh, men with borderline personality disorder get psychiatric and drug dependency services, but they tend not to get psychotherapy. And they tend not to get to, uh, referred to specialized programs. So I think uh, depending on what your role is with the person, you do want to keep that in mind that uh, you know they they would be good candidates or they should be uh, at least provided access to that. The other thing that uh, we found when we looked at this uh, in terms of men's experience with this diagnosis is they tend not to get informed about the diagnosis. And we know that one of the important strategies when working with somebody with that diagnosis is to talk frankly about the diagnosis, share information. Psychoeducation seems to be a very effective uh, beginning phase of therapy. I guess the other things I would say is that uh, some important things when you're working with men with that diagnosis is you have to establish a treatment fra framework. So the patient has to have, feel very assured about what your role is, what their role is. Um, you have to... Uh, I think be more active than you might be with other uh, clients that you have to take on responsibility to keep them in therapy and to see that as your role and even to be more active in the sessions. Um, and you have to be uh, ready to, if there's any expression of what we as therapists call negative uh, transference or negative feelings towards the therapy or yourself, you do have to be prepared to deal with them because they can uh, cause a rupture in therapy. So uh, you have to listen for that and then in a questioning way, explore those feelings if they arise. So I'll stop there. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate those insights, Paul, around men with borderline personality disorder. And I, I would add that I, I think a lot of those principles that you talk about uh, can probably be applied across other sorts of diagnoses and problems that men might present with. I think when I think about what strategies I employ to foster a good relationship with, with a new client, with a, particularly a male client, I would be thinking a lot about the kind of goals that he has or therapy, what it is that he's wanting from the therapy. And I would probably zoom out a little bit in thinking about that and think about what kind of goals is he working on in life in terms of his developmental goals? What is he striving toward? What is What kinds of problems is he hoping to solve sort of in life, in the, in the big picture? And use that as a bit of a framework and, um, sort of work around um, alignment, around seeking some sort of alignment or consensus between uh, the client and myself in terms of what we could accomplish together, what kind of goals we would, we would work on. And then I would be thinking and inviting some conversation with him about how therapy could do that and what he might expect. And, and I would try to take a pretty collaborative approach to that rather than being sort of top down and dictatorial about, you know, this is what it's going to be like, and you either have to sort of, you know, conform to that or else, you know, like, we're not, we're not going to be able to work together. So my preference is to be as collaborative and, uh, you know, inviting uh, him to share any reservations that he may have, any previous therapy experiences that he may have had. That have gone well or that haven't gone well, I would be listening for um, maybe comments that he might be making about other relationships or other interactions and interpersonal experiences that he's had in his life and whether they've gone well or whether they've gone poorly and 
if they've gone poorly, what are the reasons for, for, for them having done so in his view? Because I would be trying to integrate information uh, about that in my understanding of what he might need in the experience with me and, and what kinds of um, attitudes, perspectives, or uh, responses that I could deliver that could help him feel um, more comfortable and um, you know, feeling like he's, he's prepared to you know, engage in, in this big endeavor, right? It's, 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 it's a big deal for somebody to come into therapy and open themselves up and do this kind of work. So uh, that's, that's where I begin. What, what jumps out at me? So Christy, just for, for context, the engagement and, and communication stuff is, has kind of been my game for the past couple of years. It's what I focus on because I realized very early on, both clinically and in my research world, that if, if you don't connect with them, they're gone. <laughs> And uh, no matter what you've planned for the next session, uh, it's it's really not very useful if you can't actually build that rapport and that relationship and that respect over time. So, um, what I've what I've spent the past couple of years doing is is creating training for other clinicians uh, to better understand how to engage um, and how to build that relationship with with men um, in order to ensure this type of. Um, success because I, I don't think that clinical outcomes um are the issue here i think that um it's it's that type of adherence um to to the therapeutic um experience for lots of men that is difficult and so the the core tenets of of what i know um and has come out from from you know thousands of guys telling us you know i literally i, I went out and and one of my first surveys where we got two and a half thousand guys which is funny because everyone tells us we can't recruit men and all we did was put a simple facebook ad it cost us four hundred dollars and we got two and a half thousand guys in a fortnight and all i asked them was have you had a shit time in therapy tell us and boy did they want to talk and um and it, it was at that point when i pivoted lots of my research away from men don't seek help towards uh, this the system and services actually aren't responding to their needs and so what we learned there um, was that expectation setting is really, really important. And that's because many men come in with um, pretty poor literacy about what this looks like, what it means, how it works. It's very stereotypical. They've seen The Sopranos or they've seen a Woody Allen movie and that's what they're expecting it to be. Um, and so I spend quite a bit of time really doing a lot of purposeful psychoeducation where I, I, I orient and educate them um, as to what this thing looks like and try to build a shared understanding of what they want. Um, as, as Dave says, doing that in a collaborative way. The one thing that I will throw in there is that uh, many guys that I see, young men, especially when you ask them what they're looking for or what they want or what they've, you know, what their aims are here, they have no idea. Uh, they have no idea why they're there. <laughs> Uh, often as well, their mothers or their partners have, have you know, potentially forced them in. Um, and it becomes clearer over time, but um, I, it kind of freaks them out early on to say, so what are your goals? Um, and so we really work through the idea that, that there are many different opportunities and pathways that we can walk uh, down together um, and we'll come to those conclusions together. But um, the things that, that tend to work really well for me are... Um, being really action oriented, empowering and taking a strength based approach um, to the relationship. So not not coming in with ideas that there is something wrong, but rather that there are things to be gained here um, and being really action oriented. And, and the thing that I'm doing more and more of now is is feedback seeking, which is that. The reason that we have such high dropout rates, I think, is because there's this breakdown in communication where men don't necessarily express what what they want and what they're what they're actually experiencing in the room um, and then we get this breakdown. And so instead what we, what I try to create is a safe space where we can have a constantly evolving conversation where I'm also giving them feedback about the fact that, mate, you didn't do the homework two weeks in a row now, what are you doing? And I push them. And I think that um, understanding, you know, there's all of these comms across the men's health world that, you know, going to therapy is just like going to gym well, if, if that is the case, then we should be pushing them um, and, and trying to, to really 
maintain goals and focus on outcomes um, and, you know, have a have a constantly open discussion about what we're seeking here. So the relationship is, is everything. And I really, uh, you know, I don't push outcomes in the first couple of sessions. Um, rather, I'm really trying to build up this relationship that we can then rely on um, later on, because I often find in sessions five, six, seven, later down the line, that's when we get to the meet and it all flows out like a, you know, like a wave um, that, that can be overwhelming at times. But if you have that strong foundation, it's a lot easier.